saying good morning. It is so good to be with you all this morning and be able to praise Jesus, praise Him loudly, boldly. Let's keep that ball rolling. Amen? Amen. Let's give it to Him this morning. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start right where we left off a couple weeks ago. I know our kids today are inundated with all sorts of images, all sorts of actions, all sorts of activities that are not considered wholesome. And the reason that is, is because the world is lost. It is. The world's lost. No matter how many times we think we can save the planet, the truth of the matter is, the planet itself is lost. It's lost. And we are working in a dead and dying world. So what do we have to do? We have to be able to get as many on board the ark as we can. You know, I was something interesting. That my friend Michael, he came over yesterday during the work day, and he looked at the top of the building up here. He said, you know what? It looks like the ark has been turned upside down in here. I said, you know, you said something very poignant there. I like to think of that. That's a pretty good way to think of it. We are in the ark right now as Christians. We are in the ark. And I'm not talking about the building itself. I'm talking about the spiritual ark of God. And we need to be able to be in that ark and be able to get in here before the door closes. And God will be closing that door one day. We've got to be ready and we've got to train our young people in that. So what am I talking about this morning? Why am I getting so cold and scary about all this stuff? Because I'm telling you right now, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus doesn't hold back. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is talking here about repentance and the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus is teaching that there is depth to the law. It is not just surface level. There's a lot of people that like to try to teach the surface level. What can I do the very minimum of in order to get to heaven? That's the way most Christians think. I'm here to tell you today, if the minimum is what you're worried about, you've got a lot more to worry about than the minimum. You've got to get ready and get righteous. It means you've got to be prepared. It means you quit going on the surface and start living as Christians should. And that's what this, this Sermon on the Mount is. It is an examination of how we are to live. It means we've got to be bold, we've got to be forthcoming, and we've got to be prepared now more than ever. The law of Moses was to not commit adultery, right? Well, it's further than that. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said it is not just about going and saying one little thing. It's going to the very depth and the very heart of the law. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, it reads, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. you catching that, right? To understand the concept of lust here, I think the ESV does a pretty good job. When you go and you look at what the English Standard Version says, it says right there, lustful intent. Okay? You all ever watch a movie and think that an actor or actress looks very pretty? You ever watch a movie and you feel like, yeah, that's a pretty person on there. They, got a, they cast it that pretty good. And they look, they look nice and they're pretty, but you don't think nothing else about it, right? And that's the way it should be. The problem is when you go beyond that, when you start obsessing over it. You see, God instilled in our hearts a willingness to look and admire and be attracted to certain qualities. Beauty's one of them. The inner beauty of an individual. To find them attractive and desirable is part of how we end up getting married in the first place. It's how we end up being together. To find another person attractive and desirable is not sin because those thoughts and feelings are created with us, within us by God. Now Jesus describes what sin is. The lustful intent. And it goes further in the Greek. When you go and you examine Luke chapter 15 verse 16 and Matthew 13, 17. When you look at those verses and you look very carefully at what is being said here, the word is translated longing. To long for something. When you long to be sinful, you're in, prob you're in a problem land. You're in a dangerous place when you're longing for sin. 
And that's what Jesus is saying. Lustful longing or sensual longing is the concept under consideration here. The looking in order to lust. It is where we get this idea when we, we ever hear the words, when we hear the words pornography. You ever hear, you know, we all heard the word pornography. And we see it inundated all over our culture today. Well, what is pornography? It's based out of two Greek words. Graphy, which means a picture or image, and pornea. Pornea is where we get the word porn from. It means something that causes us to lust. Something that brings about arousal. A love of arousal, if you will. Imagine that. That's the world definition of love today. Honest truth. It's pornea. Because when you hear these guys singing, you remember the old ballads when we used, I want to know what love is. You remember that song? Yeah, you all remember foreigners singing that, don't you? Yeah, you all remember that? You know what love is? <laughs> that love they singing is pornea, okay? That's the song they singing, okay? That's the kind of love they singing about. The love Jesus is talking about is agape. Okay? Agape love is godly love. It's wholesome love. It's love that encourages and builds and strengthens based on what God wants, not what we want. We don't want pornea in our life. Pornea is not what we need. Pornea is dangerous. It can kill us. And if you don't believe me, ask some of these young men that are addicted to pornography today. They'll definitely tell you, straight out, no questions asked. Those images are burned into their brain. In fact, so many of so that they actually kill themselves because they can't get the images out of their head. Now, there are a lot of people, oh, you're, you're exaggerating, Robbie. I'm being serious. When we let our desires cut into the point to where we can't go and meet those outside of what we're looking at, we want to go and find something in a relationship with somebody and those images are burned in our brain so much that we look at everybody and judge them on a standard that they can never meet. Guess what? That's what the devil wants. The devil doesn't want us to find God and godly people. He doesn't want us to find a godly spouse. He wants us to find an image that turns on us that makes us think, hey, this is what I want. That's dangerous. And it's something we've got to look at closer. And the, given the 10th commandment at Sinai, I want you to listen to what Moses says here. In Exodus 20, verse 17, it reads, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, some people would say, well, what's that got to do with adultery? Well, you did see his neighbor's wife in there. But there's more than that. Three commandments earlier, God declared that you shall not commit adultery. There is certainly not an end to the matter, though. You are not allowed to covet your neighbor's wife. That means that you didn't lust desire, or delight in. Therefore, it is not merely just looking, but what is going on in the mind while you're looking. You can go and look at your neighbor's boat and say, that's an awesome boat. Man, I can't wait. That'd be something fun to get out on with you, man. You want to go out and do it? Yeah, why don't you come on out? You and the wife come on out. We'll go out on the boat and we'll go cruising on the lake. All right, awesome. And then... There's a difference there when you go and you look at your neighbor's boat and say, hmm, I wish I had that. And you start selling everything you got or you start spending more time looking at that boat or looking at something. You see what I'm getting at? When you start replacing that, I know it sounds silly, right? Looking at a boat and getting that feeling. But guess what? That's what people did. People wanted to be able to have what they didn't have. That's what lust is. Lusting after somebody else's job lusting after somebody else's house or their car or their spouse. If I go up to the neighbor's wife and, think, and say, you look lovely today, is that a bad thing? No, that's not sinful. In fact, that's an encouragement. You're appreciating what God has created. 
Now, when I'm going and I say, girl, you look good today, and in my brain, I'm sitting there thinking, you know what, I'd like to take her on a date tonight. That's where the problem is. Okay? I'm a married man. I shouldn't be thinking like that, and I sure shouldn't be saying things like that. That means that we've got to be different. Okay? Think differently. Act differently. Be differently. Now, if you're a single young man and you want to approach a young lady and tell her she looks beautiful and you want to go on a date with her, bravo, do that. But don't do it with the wrong intention in mind. Go on a date with her to be able to be encouraged and built up by her and get to know her. Don't go and take her out because you think you're going to get something at the end of the night. That's not why we do things. And that is not what the world is teaching our children. Our, our world is teaching our children it's okay to do those things. It's only natural to do those things. You're teenage kids. You're going to want to experiment. You're going to want to do things. So practice safely. Let me tell you something right now. There's no such thing as safe. The only thing that's safe is called abstinence. That means stay away from it. Okay? Yeah, you can hug each other. You can hold hands. Shoot, you can even kiss. However, don't let it go to the point where it goes to the point overboard that you're lusting after that individual, that your heart is burning for them. Now, parents, this is where we come in. As parents, this is where we come in. We need to be willing to teach our children the desire of God before the desire of self. That means we've got to be willing to spend time with our kids in the Word. Well, I'm not qualified to do that. Yes, you are. If you are a believer and you believe in Jesus Christ, you should be looking at your Bible regularly. You should be reading your Bible regularly. Take time out. Start small. Do a little thing here and there for you. Then take it to your kids and pass it down. Parents, the church has your children in here for an hour, maybe two at tops during the week. How many hours do you have your children? You have your children all the time minus school. And are you going to let your school teach your children the morals they need to have? I hope not. Because the school system is going downhill fast. That doesn't mean I'm going to go and put down these poor teachers that are working out here. No. I'm talking about the people with agendas that are trying to make life hard on your children and you. And moreover, try to turn God away at the door. I understand there are teachers today that are fighting to do everything they can to give their very best to their students. And we need more of those teachers. But there are people today that are just dead set. Their heart is set on going and trying to make normal what is not normal and make right what is wrong in the sight of God. I don't have to go any further in explaining that, do I? You all know what I'm talking about. You all see it. The implications are there. It's why you are allowed in your mind. That's why it is so important for us to go and talk about what's going on in our mind when it's related to God. Because we need to be able to embrace what God wants. People will ask, what's the big deal if you fantasize about another person or look at some kind of images online or magazine? I want you to listen to what Jesus says here in Matthew 15, 19 to 20. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. You see, sin begins... How many times have you ever heard somebody say the words, tell it, just, just listen to your heart. Listen to what your heart says. Even hear preachers say it today. Preacher, listen to what your heart's telling you. You don't want to turn to Jesus. Let me tell you what, right now. Jesus even said, don't listen to your heart, listen to God. Pay attention to what, because unfortunately our heart is corrupted. Our hearts are sinful. We as human beings are sinful. Now if we are Christians, our hearts must be changed, right? Part of that is growing and getting closer to God. That's what he's wanting here. Sin begins in the heart. These sins don't just happen by accident, but begin by allowing the mind to indulge in the kind of thinking. You are, not, you are allowing your mind to have lustful intent. As one writer writes, no married person 
can do justice to his mate while giving over to unrestrained desire for another. I want you to think about this for a minute. Tarpon, I'm going to put you on the spot. Don't worry, I promise, Tarpon's not like this. Tarpon goes up, and I want you to, I want you to ask Kim one day, I want you to tell Kim, when you, you, you're looking at a picture of a pretty girl in the magazine, and you, said, and you say this to her, you go and you look right at her, and you go and say, well, you know what? This girl is right pretty. You know, I, I bet I think about her more than I think about you. You want me to get killed? <laughs> I got not that I not maybe not that I mean anything by. I mean I'm just looking at her. I'm not actually with her. I'm just looking at her. Kim, how are you gonna feel about that? I think the look says it all. <laughs> She's like dead. The pack is bag. That's right. Amen. Now, see, Tarpon ain't like that. I know that. Kim and Tarpon are not like that. You don't have to worry about him doing all that mess. But there are guys today, they think they can get away with that kind of thing. They think they can look at a porno mag, or they think they can look online and find all those images and find, and, and, and find contentment in that. But I guarantee you they're not going to go up to the girlfriend and they're going to go, oh, baby, I think about them all the time when I'm talking to you. Do you really think that's going to go over well? Probably not. I guarantee you gonna be, there's going to be more than one guy packing out of the house if they're honest about it. That's why guys keep that kind of stuff quiet. Now, guys, you're not alone. There are women looking at this stuff, too. There are women looking at this. Still, back in the day, it used to be a guy thing. Now it's everybody. Women are looking at this stuff. And they're starting to get that desire, that same pornea that we have in our hearts. The guys, we look at things and we have a lustful intent. We look at guys, you know, we, they look at guys, and they look like the same way we look at girls. Now, guys, I'm telling you right now, that's dangerous, guys. Girls, that's terrible. We can't do that. This is why God called Israel unfaithful to him and his covenant adultery. They were, adulter they were committing adultery. Israel was committing adultery with God. And he used Hosea to show that. You all remember that? He married up with a hooker named Gomer. He married up with a prostitute named Gomer, and they ended up going, and Gomer would always leave him, and she'd always go back to doing what she used to be doing, and he'd go back out with all love in his heart, take care of her, bring her back. Why did he do that? Why did God make that happen? Because he's trying to prove to Israel, say, look, this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing. You're that prostitute. You're going out, and you're giving yourself up to all the sins and all the desires of this world. Guys, Ladies, we're all guilty of that. And we've got to stop it at the source. And I'm telling you now, it's more than just being addicted and lusting after another person's body. You might lust after something else. Maybe it's your academic standing in school. Maybe it's your athletics in school. Maybe it's your kids doing good in athletics or your grandkids doing good in athletics or in, in academics. I'm here to tell you today, praise God first and your kids will be blessed. Teach them about eternal life first before you start getting them into everything under the sun that the world wants them to have. A good education is okay. Good athletics is fine, but eternal life is exactly that, eternal life. And it's something we need to be teaching our children every single day as parents. I'm blessed to have a child, a young lady living with me right now that is a believer, and that's my daughter Rose. Now Levi's out on his own. He's teaching his family and encouraging them to be people of the book. He's doing that himself too. And now you've got Rose. She's going and she is minded on living and loving Jesus. She even has a folder, I like all these folders in her room. All these little different folders for different things in her life. And the big one over here on the side is one labeled church. Well, what is that about? She's studying the Word. 
Why is she studying the Word? Because she wants to be better. She wants to be prepared eternally. She doesn't want to be just sitting here thinking, well, I guess I'll go to heaven. She wants to say, no, 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 I'm going to heaven. And I've got my bags packed, so when Jesus comes, and when Jesus says, Rose, it's time to go to heaven, I'm ready. And let me tell you something. I can ask many parents the same question. Are your kids able to say that? Are your kids able to say that today? Or are they saying, well, I'm ready for the big ball game. Or I'm ready for the big college test. Or I'm ready for this. Or I'm ready for that. I want to know if your kid says these words. I'm ready to go to heaven when he calls me. I have to answer that question every day. Am I doing enough to get my children to God to build them closer to a relationship with God? That's not indoctrination. That's called being willing to give your best to God. So many people want to give their best to this world, but the world isn't going to give you anything in return. You can't take it with you. But one thing you can take with you is the love of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. There's a remedy for it. There is a remedy in verses 29 to 30. Read this with me real quick. Chapter 5, verses, verses 29 and 30. Look at these words together with me. It might sound a little off, but you know what? I want you to pay close attention to them. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than to lose your whole body and be thrown to heaven and thrown to hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than it is for your whole body to go into hell. You catch that? Poke out your eye, cut off your hand. Now a lot of people look at me and go, well, he ain't being serious about this. Oh, he's being serious about this. He's not saying, no, okay, you're looking at porn, poke your eye out. Cut your hand off. He's not doing that. You know what he's doing? He's saying, do that spiritually. Cut your hand off, poke your eye out spiritually. How do you do that? If it's causing you to sin, what do you do? It's life or death. It reminds me of a, le this t a story I heard the other day in the news. I heard about a hiker that got stuck. His, his, he fell and slid down the hill, and a rock got caught on his arm. Well, he couldn't move. And he stayed there for a couple of days, and he was trying to get loose, and he couldn't get loose. So you know what he had to do? Life or death. He had to cut his arm off. He had to cut his arm off in order to go and get help to be able to cure his body, to help his body. It's a matter of life or death. Let me be honest with you folks. This is a matter of life or death, spiritually and eternally. This means it lasts forever. The logic that Jesus has given us here is depth. Spiritual depth to spiritual death. The depth that he's going into. Are you willing to do and sacrifice what you have to in order to prevent yourself from sinning? If the internet is sending in blatant images causing you to sin, what do you do? Cut it off. If you're watching too many TikTok videos that are telling you to do something you shouldn't be doing, what do you do? Cut it off. Turn it off. Take the app off. Take the source off. It's like I was talking to the folks over at Mount Gilead this morning. Now, there's a lot of older folks at Mount Gilead, and I'm going to tell you right now, some of you guys remember a time before the internet some of you probably some of you might not but I do I remember a brief period in my life and it was probably the best time of my life because I actually went outside and did things and let me tell you before the internet came along the world was so much different we didn't have to worry about cell phones did we we didn't have cell phones we had we had regular landline phones and boy if you went back far enough you had Landline phones with the party line on them. Y'all remember the party line? Everybody say, well, party line, well, that sounds like a good thing. <laughs> Not in my grandma's house. Grandma would be on the phone, Mary Kay, get off here. I want to talk to my son. 
You've been on there all day talking to your boyfriend. I want to talk to my boy. <laughs> She'd be getting all up in there and talking about all sorts of things. She'd be fussing and fuming. But do you know something? Life was simpler then. It really was. You know, they had those kind of things going on. Obviously, Jesus had those kind of things going on in his, in his time. She didn't have the preference. They had, it didn't have the prevalence of what's in our society today. The breadth of everything that's coming in. The dangers that are all around us. Sin, lustful intent, needs an aggressive response. It means we act immediately. A person who does not make an extremely aggressive response against lust does not love the Lord. We might fight for purity if we are God's people. Right? We're supposed to. Not just might, we must. We have to. God's people do not get close to the fire and think that they can play close to sin. We don't say, how little do I need to do in order to get to heaven? I'm telling you now, if you're coming to church and you think that's all you've got to do to get to heaven, i got bad news for you. Church attendance is not going to get you to heaven. Jesus is going to get you to heaven. And you best better have a relationship with Jesus because if you're just coming to church and going through the motions, the minute you walk out that door, you are just as close to going to hell as you are when you came in the doors this morning. Because church attendance ain't going to get you to heaven. Now you all might say, well, Robbie, you told us that we need to be in church. We need to attend. Yes, you should attend. But where's your heart? Where's your heart? God doesn't care about you coming in and sitting here for an hour. What God wants is your heart. He doesn't just want you on a Sunday. He wants you every day. He wants you every single day living for Him, singing for Him, loving Him, giving Him your best. Not hiding away. Not trying to go and cut out of here early because you need to get to the lunch house. Forget that. It's time we got close to Jesus. If we were as close to Jesus as we were as some of these waiters that are in the, in the restaurants today, we might actually be getting somewhere. We need to be real Christians. Living, breathing embodiments of what it is to be Christians. Now some people would say, Robbie, you're being kind of mean to people. The first person I have to be mean to is me. Guys, I fail every day at this. And I'm not just saying that to pull a heartstring. I'm being honest with you here. I fail every day. We all do. And we're all called to be able to hold each other accountable and love one another. That's what Jesus wants us to do. God's people need to make extreme decisions. We need to be very bold about our steps forward and who we serve. Young men and young women need to be taught to love Jesus above all things. Forget about the lures of this world because they're temporary. Just as Paul said in Colossians 3, 5, and 6, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. If your stomach is telling you that you need to pay more attention to it than Jesus, you tell your stomach to shut up. I'll get there when I get there. If your heart is saying, I need to get home so I can watch that one video that's online that my buddy told me about with that one girl in it, you tell your heart to shut up. When you go home, you're going to take and throw that internet cord away if you have to in order to prevent yourself from falling into the trap. Listen to what scriptures are saying. We are responsible to take extreme measures in our fight against sin. This is not something we just sneeze at. This is not something we just blink at and say, oh, it's okay. 
Fight against the computer. Fight against the movies. Fight against the TV shows. You are falling into sin through these things, and you must fight against them. We must act decisively, even if it's a painful choice to make. Our children deserve that. We deserve that. If we call ourselves Christian, Jesus deserves that. Cut sin and temptation out of our lives. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord for a pure heart. You hearing that? Now you might wonder what the reason is for why we got to fight for purity. Not only has Jesus declared that the person has committed adultery in the heart, but also states that the person who does not fight for purity will be cast into hell. These are the same people that go and tell you that love is love, no matter what. No, that's not true. Love is love when it's Jesus' love. The love that they're talking about is pornea. Remember what I talked about before. I guarantee if you told your spouse or your loved one that you weren't thinking pure intent, they would probably not like that. You would probably be looked at badly. Now, this is only the second time Jesus has spoken about hell in a sermon. The last paragraph he went and he talked about the people that called his brother a name and insulted his brother was liable to the fires of hell. Jesus now says that if you don't put to death the sinful, the sin, sinful members of your body, you can face hell. This means we have to fight with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our spirit. We need to give our best to God. Jesus is teaching us that these things are stemming from our hearts. It is not enough to say that we have not committed the sexual act of adultery. We need to pursue and be willing to go further and be changed inside and out. Jesus is awakening our hearts to the reality of our failure before. Adultery must not be avoided, but lust intent also needs to be at. All of it. What is driving our hearts today? As we end it, we need to say one important thing. I want you to listen carefully. Sexual sin, adultery, are forgivable sins. Do you hear me? Sexual sins are forgivable. They are. Now, you will have to deal with consequences in that, sure. If you are facing divorce because of your sexual sins, and we'll talk more about divorce next week. But this week, I want to focus on this. You're going to be having to face the consequences, right? Sure. But do you know what? People are people. And God is God. People might not forgive you. But God will. This is why Jesus is preaching this sermon. He's preaching repentance and the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is that you can be forgiven for whatever you do against the kingdom of God. There is no such thing as an unforgivable sin except the sin of not believing. That's the only unforgivable sin. Denying the truth, denying the Spirit, denying God. And that is in the heart of the individual as well, isn't it? That's why we have to start at the heart. Young men, young women, listen to me when I say, be serious about your walk with Jesus. Be committed to God. And be willing to cut those things out that are going to hurt your walk with Him. I wish someone had taught me that when I was as young as some of you all are in here. It took me until I was 27 to learn that sin had consequences that were not just detrimental to my physical life and to my married life, 
but to my spiritual life and my eternal life. Though forgiven by God, we still experience the consequences for our sin. But we need to cut the temptations that bring you to sin in the first place. Cut them out. It's not evil to be tempted. It's evil to be falling into your temptation. That's what leads to evil. Fight for purity. Flee lusts. Turn to the Lord for forgiveness. This is the call of Jesus today. Folks, this morning, if you've got a need in your heart, if there is something that is holding you back, something you're hanging on to and causing you to have lustful intentions with, yeah, it can be physical attraction to people. It could be pornography. It could be adultery. It could be any of those things, but it could also be something that's holding you back where you're coveting something else of this world. If there is something that is holding you back from loving Jesus and serving Jesus 110%, lay it at the foot of the cross. Give it to Him today. Not tomorrow. Now. Today is the day of salvation.